Welcome back to Nova Scotia, it's Alex Belfield. Meeting the people who bring you the most interesting and uh, exciting things to do here in Halifax, we've come to the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic and uh, Dan Conlin joins us. How are you? Oh, not bad. Thanks so much for having us today. And of course, your location is perfect, isn't it? Right here, just on the uh, coastline. You've got the ships outside, loads of exciting things to do. Lots of stalls as well. There's a real atmosphere. Yeah, we're uh, right on the waterfront, downtown Halifax, a great strategic port of the world. So you see the world's cargo ships coming by, the warships coming by, and right in front of our door ship, doorstep in 1912, the cable ships passed up the harbour with the bodies of Titanic victims. Of course, the water and Halifax and Nova Scotia go hand in hand, don't they? So you've got to have a museum like this. How interested are people to find out about the water and its history? Nova Scotia is almost an island, so we have a really deep uh, and rich seafaring history. And even though we're a small province in Canada, we actually have Canada's oldest, largest maritime museum. For a lot of tourists, and ironically enough, a lot of cruise ship passengers, Titanic is is, uh, is how they've heard about us. Uh, we like to remind them that we're the birthplace of Samuel Canard, who invented the modern ocean liner and launched the Canard Line, for example. Um, and uh, But um, shipwrecks, and especially Titanic, really uh, put us on the map, so to speak. And of course, even today, shipbuilding is such a big part of Halifax, just uh, driving uh, down past the river today. I mean, there are still places where ships are being built. Yeah, we have a large, big uh, shipyard that uh, builds and repairs ships and is uh, busy sort of rearming the Canadian Navy to build the Navy of the future. So uh, we're still a busy modern seaport. Tell me about the people who come here. I'm imagining all different age groups. The kids are fascinated by it as much as the adults. Yeah, so that's um, one thing about Titanic. It really does cross a real broad spectrum from just little tiny kids to uh, to seniors and everything, everybody in between. It's uh, it's a big story. And I think one reason Titanic has the great appeal is um, there was such a range of people aboard the ship. Old, young, different income levels, um, all kinds of different classes. So we can all picture ourselves aboard Titanic in one fashion or another another. One of the things I'm learning are the stories that have come out of the Titanic. Of course, the various classes that were on there, the structures that followed, the women and the children went first. There were still a lot of children that perished, and of course, women as well. Um, we just went to the cemetery earlier, and, and that was just fascinating. And of course, this story keeps moving, doesn't it? New stories are being found literally every single month. Yes, uh, there were an awful lot of... Um, they only found one in five bodies, and um, initially half the bodies they found were unidentified. So right in 1912, there was a riddle to, to sort out the identities and they did a pretty good job they got about two-thirds of them identified but if you go to the titanic cemeteries in halifax which, which is the largest collection of titanic burials of the world you'll see uh, see all these unknown graves and there is much uh, speculation and detective work that goes on uh, today about trying to figure out who those folks were let's take a walk through the museum as we walk around so many artifacts here are you forever changing and collating and moving things around and bringing new things in? Well, we have um, our museum has a large shipwreck exhibit we're in the middle of the shipwreck exhibit right now and uh, new shipwrecks are being discovered and researched so we add that um, to them and then Titanic material kind of shows up regularly um, usually from families uh, in Nova Scotia who had a relative connected to Titanic uh, you know, a grandpa who went out and found bodies and kept a little piece of flotsam and then those families will show up and say do you want it for your museum? So we regularly kind of Acquire little bits of Titanic that floated to the surface in 1912, and we're always adding those to our exhibit. Of course, the ship itself, Titanic, is still underwater. Do you think eventually it will just disintegrate? It will waste away in, in the very cold waters that are, are right out there? Well, Titanic is certainly very cold, very deep, and it is slowly disintegrating, but slowly. Compared to a lot of the shipwrecks on the coast of Nova Scotia, which are ripped apart by waves, there is a lot of material evidence on Titanic. So I think she'll be a, a fascinating research platform for scientists and historians for generations, even as she kind of slowly dissolves. It has to be one of the greatest PR disasters of all time, saying a ship that couldn't sink ultimately ended up at the bottom of the ocean, because you never know what you're going to run into, do you? Yes, uh, um, the, well, I think one of the reasons Titanic is such a powerful story is the whole hubris thing, the notion that uh, people were so overconfident about technology at the turn of the last century that they were a ship this big with you know modern steam engines, electric lights and wireless could never be overcome by disaster. Um, historians debate a bit about the, to the extent that with the White our line promoter is unsinkable, but there's lots of references talking about design to be unsinkable, virtually unsinkable. That great quote, uh, but one of the stewards, God himself could not sink this ship. Uh, so, um, so Titanic is a real reminder of the fallibility of technology. 
And uh, an interesting note for Halifax, the White Star Line, the company that built Titanic, uh, one of their very first ships sank with great loss of life at the entrance of Halifax in 1873. <laughs> so uh, the, the SS Atlantic and a sad little precursor to Titanic. So um, there was quite a long history of ocean liners kind of meeting very grim fates. And of course, fundamentally, it was flawed in the sense there weren't enough lifeboats to save the people that were on board. I mean, they, they could never have all got in the boats, could they, even if they were filled to capacity, which they weren't. The lifeboats are the sad, grim part of the equation for Titanic. Uh, there just weren't enough lifeboats for everybody. And that meant um, loading lifeboats and evacuation was haphazardous and chaotic. Plus, there had been no lifeboat drills, no preparation for evacuating the ship of that size. Very much a product of outdated um, uh, safety regulations. Um, they were meant for vessels of a much smaller size. Nobody had been building ships as big as Titanic and regulation hadn't kept pace and that just set up this fatal chain of events where we're darn lucky that Titanic wasn't booked to capacity because of a labor strike at the time um, there would have been even more deaths if she had a full capacity of passengers and one of the main reasons there weren't enough life boats was it was aesthetically not pleasing to see all those boats on the outside so that's one of the reasons they didn't have them which isn't a great reason not to have boats that can save people's lives well aesthetics were part of that ocean liner companies really love those big open boat decks and and uh, sort of boat, uh, lifeboats sort of clutter the deck. They also take a lot of money for maintenance. Um, but also, they didn't think they'd really need them. They thought they would be using lifeboats to sort of shuttle back and forth to a rescue ship close at hand. They, uh, the idea of the whole ship being overwhelmed within hours, they didn't think it would happen. Uh, we know now all too well that it can happen. And we found out, obviously, since that it was four days crossing the ocean, and then it only took three hours for it to sink. I mean, a remarkably short period of time. Um, yes, in some ways, although it was a very long mortal gash in the side of the ship. Uh, and, um, you know, some thought has to be given to all those heroic engineers who kept the, the pumps going and the lights going, etc. Just, you know, struggling to keep her afloat as long as they could. Um, so uh, it's, um, but it's, it, yeah, it's a grim equation of three hours, the biggest ship in the world is gone. Coming back to the museum itself, how do you keep up with the times to make sure it's interesting? I notice there's lots of visual and audio stuff, TV screens. Um, the idea of bringing a kid just to read for three hours in a museum ain't going to work these days, is it? Um, yes, um, although Titanic is one of those stories, just the visual power alone, I think, uh, compels people. We have we have really beautiful period images that are blown up. We have a replica deck chair that you can sit in. Uh, we have some spectacular models. And, um, and then we also have staff who um, uh, often do dramatic presentations and you dress up like a Titanic uh, crew member or a Titanic passenger and engage people in those ways. We've come to probably one of the most famous and iconic of all the displays. Tell us about it, Dan. It's Titanic's deck chair. Uh, you know, there's nothing more iconic about Titanic than the deck chairs, rearranging the deck chairs on Titanic, etc. And this is one of the world's only surviving deck chairs of Titanic. And it's a lovely, elegant piece of Edwardian lawn furniture. Um, there were over 400 aboard these uh, aboard Titanic. And this one was found by the ship that was searching for the bodies called the Minia. And it was given to the Anglican minister aboard, the Church of England minister who was doing counseling of crew members, burials at sea. And he did such a good job, the crewmen gave him the nicest uh, deck chair that they found. So his family donated to our museum, and it sits here kind of as a, it's, a, it's sort of something about the elegance of the ship, but it's also an empty chair and reminds of, of all the people who didn't make it. So it's one of the sort of the, um, uh, the sort of the, the iconic pieces to our Titanic exhibit. It's so beautifully made. I mean, it wouldn't look out of place in a garden today, would it? No, it, it wouldn't, although it's interesting. It's all handcrafted. We, uh, we took very detailed measurements of this to make an exact replica. We discovered that none of the measurements are perfectly even. You know, even in an era of the beginning of mass production, this, this was still being made by a handcrafted by a carpenter in a workshop somewhere. So it, it is a little crossover between that 19th century craftsmanship and the mass production of the 20th century. Uh, you know, I also think of, you know, the baker aboard Titanic. He, sp he threw dozens of these overboard, hoping people could cling to them uh, in the water. And um, it's, uh, it is a chilling thought to think about who sat, uh, sat in this chair. Did they survive? We, uh, we build a replica of this chair, an exact replica, so people can actually sit on it. And we have that sort of sitting in front of a photo mural with people walking past actual deck chairs on the Titanic to, you know, engross people in that experience. What makes our museum special, our kind of claim to fame amid the various Titanic exhibits around the world, is we have the world's largest collection of wooden objects from Titanic. When the ship sank, it split in half, and all that beautiful carved woodwork floated to the surface and was found with all the bodies uh, when the ships in Halifax were searching for victims of the, of the sinking. So we have some spectacularly beautifully carved pieces. The one in front of me is, is a big archway, a meter and a half across, and this was the entrance to the first-class lounge aboard Titanic, a room that was so spectacular it was based upon the Palliser 
Versailles uh, interior in France, and um, a lovely hand-carved piece of oak. Um, this piece itself was so riveting that when James Cameron made his blockbuster Titanic movie, he actually crafted a prop to look exactly like this uh, actual fragment for the big lover's death scene in the movie. They're clinging to a floating piece of wreckage. It's actually a copy of this artifact at our collection. But it looks in such perfect condition. Well, it was very good quality oak, um, uh, and um, it, it was cleaned by museum conservators. The Titanic Historical Society gave us some money to sort of clean it up. Um, you can see there's a little bit of cracking, but it's really high quality, dense quarter cut oak, and you know, survived the breakup of the ship and several days in the North Atlantic remarkably well. Mm. And of course, what we are left thinking is what is still down there. Uh, is there any possibility anything else will be recovered at this stage, or have they closed the book with that? Well, Titanic has been the subject of fairly intensive salvage by treasure hunting companies, notably RMS Titanic Incorporated. Um, our museum, because we're kind of fairly closely um, allied with archaeologists, uh, have been totally comfortable with the mass retrieval of objects. Um, uh, at this point, I think they have so much objects that they have enough for sort of to, to ex display and exhibit. Um, what we'd love to see is the map to be precisely mapped by archaeologists before anything else is recovered. And um, and that's probably, I think, what's going to happen in years to come. The um, uh, What we generally find about the woodwork on Titanic, because it's been submerged at such great depths, there's very little wood left. And again, that makes the, the fragments in our collection very special because they're as they looked in 1912. The magnificence of the staircase we see in front is a picture of it. Just mind-boggling and incredibly expensive. Yes, it was. It was expensive, beautifully hand-carved woodwork, um, wonderful cast bronze statues, and a huge um, extravagant use of space uh, on you know a ship where you're trying to cram as many people as possible. So that first-class stairway is kind of one of the great set pieces of Titanic. We have um, we have pieces of railings uh, from the first-class staircase. We have a beautiful newel post with incredibly deep carvings of it, um, and uh, and it really gives you an idea of the opulence of that part of the ship. The second most famous thing after the Titanic itself is, of course, the movie uh, with Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio, which everybody seemed to love, number one for weeks and weeks on end. I know that uh, James Cameron spent a lot of time here in Halifax studying uh, the boat, studying what was left and coming here and finding out all about it so he could make it as close to the truth as possible. Yes, uh, Cameron was here, visited our museum, took note of, of uh, fragments and, you know, copied some of them. Uh, he also hired some top-notch researchers who we've been corresponding with years to make sure they got everything from the lifeboats to the uh, the look of the mask correctly. And uh, and much of the mo movie was actually shot in Halifax. The uh, sort of contemporary part of the movie where the submarines are going down was all shot at the entrance to our harbor. So uh, sort of many folks have stories about the making of Titanic here. And they're going to re-release it, I understand, for the 100th anniversary. Yes, yes. Uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of how that movie is sort of uh, is redone. Uh, many of our staff, I must confess, though, still have a great fondness for the old Night to Remember movie in the 50s. Um, uh, and it's interesting to see how just what a classic film that was and how it really inspired a lot of Cameron's sort of setups of the sinking. It was so sophisticated for its day, wasn't it? Well, it was. Wonderful, wonderful model work. And uh, even though it's shot in black and white, I think your imagination kind of fills in many of the gaps. Okay, let's take one last thing then before we go. We could literally be here all day. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of items. How many are there in the museum itself relating to the Titanic? Uh, we've got about um, 35 original pieces of Titanic, and then we've got about a sort of another 30 sort of associated object of the period or of her sister ship Olympic. Okay, let's take a final item then. Uh, a pair of baby shoes. Yeah, they're a small pair of, of baby shoes, a uh, small item, but really kind of big in terms of their emotional impact. And these are the shoes of the unknown child, the little two-year-old uh, who the uh, sailors from Halifax found floating uh, in his nightdress. And it was one of the first bodies they found, and uh, it, um, it really moved the sailors immensely. Um, they, uh, they, they kind of took an oath that if the family was never identified, they would take care of the burial of this little boy themselves. And uh, he wasn't identified in 1912 and became known as the unknown child. And uh, his little coffin was taken to the grave by the sailors acting as pallbearers. And, uh, and they, um, they and other people paid for a lovely sort of uh, art deco uh, monument uh, on his grave. And um, they kept uh, his little brown shoe and his night shirt for months and months, hoping a family would use them to identify them. And then after that, the clothing was supposed to be burned. But the Halifax police sergeant looking after the clothing didn't have the heart to burn the little pair of baby shoes. So he put them in the drawer at the police station and kept them and gave them to his son, who gave them to his son, and then the family donated them to our museum. So these little pair of shoes, and it's hard not to imagine a little boy sitting in them. And um, these shoes also became very interesting in recent years because the, that body 
body of the unknown child was subject to DNA analysis. And there was this interesting quest about who the boy would be, and they narrowed it down to two families. And our shoe, the size of our shoe, was a critical piece of evidence in uh, leading the scientists to finally decide that the, uh, the unknown child is actually an English boy named Sidney Leslie Goodwin. And so we actually now know who the unknown child is. And, um, uh, and it's, it's one of those mysteries of Titanic that kind of continue to be sort of explored through pieces of evidence like this. Um, although I think for many folks, he'll always be the unknown child because he stands in for, you know, almost 100 children who died aboard Titanic. I know for a while they thought it was the mother of four children who perished uh, and the Titanic, but it wasn't in the end because as you go to the cemetery, it's the second biggest memorial in the cemetery for the unknown child who's now known, but they're not going to put the name on it. He's still the unknown child. Yes, we're currently looking at a way that we can identify the grave without sort of altering the, the tombstone that the sailors paid for in 1912. And I think we'll probably, we'll figure out a way to do that and still kind of leave the original marker there. Um, you're right in terms of the, there was a Swedish woman with uh, four children who ironically is buried the next row over and many people thought her little two-year-old boy was this two-year-old boy but science ruled that out uh and again, this, this DNA stuff really is proving invaluable. Um, and I, I feel, having spent a few days here learning about it, they're going to keep finding out more and more stuff as time goes on because we, there are so many unanswered questions still, aren't there, even in 2011, 2012? Yes, it's, it's amazing with Titanic. You know, we know the outlines pretty much without question. But uh, within that big one story, there's, you know, there's 3,000 smaller stories, and many of those have question marks that, you know, we all kind of wonder about, and I'm, I'm sure people will be uh, chasing after answers for generations to come. Dan, really nice talking to you. Thank you so much for the tour of the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. Just tremendous. Come down here and see all these artifacts. Spooky in a way, because you, you can't help but go back to the tragedy itself and think of the stories around it. I mean, it's really very moving, this, this exhibit. Yes, uh, it, it, um, it is moving, and I notice it's a, uh, our exhibit can get very crowded. This exhibit is always still very quiet, though. There's almost a hush tone as people go through it, uh, and it includes families with large numbers of kids. It's a very sombering, reflective um, way of exploring the tragedy. And thank you so much for talking to me. My pleasure.